Um, so with that, uh, let's step into the discussion. Let's get it started. So uh, just to give a little bit of background, we want to make sure that we introduce this topic. Um, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm getting emails that some people can't get in. So we always have a term of the month um, that uh, we like to share because, and, and sometimes they're terms that you've never heard of because they're medical terms, um, but sometimes they're terms that you have heard of that you may have a very uh, specific sort of definition of it in your mind. And we wanna make sure that we uh, set the, the, the table as far as uh, how research looks at it and how it's defined in research. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Mikkel, uh, and we have Dr. Alhendi, yay, sorry for the difficulty. Hi, sorry, um, I clicked on the Zoom link and asked me to register, and I registered, and I kept going in circles and so on, sorry, I'm not sure what happened. So. No, it's okay, it's okay, we're just glad to have you, we were worried that we were going to have to represent or have people from your lab put them on the spot. <laughs> well, thank you, I'm really excited to be here, this is so important. So. Yes, yes, um, uh, so thank you, we were actually just about to go through, um, you know, a little bit of, I think as you termed it, sort of Public Health 101, um, using the WHO and NIH definition. So Mikkel, you wanna take us through these just as a quick? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so every month we have a term of the month. And so this month, our term is prevention. And so first we have tertiary prevention, which is usually what we talk about given knowledge of fibroids. Prevention research usually encompasses both primary and secondary research. And so secondary is intervention early in the disease, which is to stop or minimize progression. And it's also talked about as early detection, screening, and treatment opportunities for fibroids research. And then lastly, primary prevention, which includes research designed to promote health, identify risk factors, or developing a new health condition. And it's also to stop a disease before it occurs, health promotion, risk factors, avoidance, onset, and prevention. Next slide, please. Well, before we go, I just want to draw your attention to, so typically when we have all our events with the White Dress Project, because we are um, talking to you as um, someone who has fibroids, we talk a lot about tertiary prevention because you're already there. So we're so excited to really focus on secondary and primary intervention today, which is really catching it early, um, which is absolutely critical to, to reducing the suffering. And then as well, potentially stopping it before it occurs, which is where the really exciting work is happening, Dr. Alhendi, yay. Uh, all right. And primary prevention research includes studies that identify and assess risk and protective factors, screen and identify individuals and groups at risk, develop and evaluate interventions to reduce risks, translate, implement, and disseminate effective preventative interventions into practice, and lastly, develop methods to prevent, methods to support preventative research. And from here, we'll kind of hand it over to Dr. Alhendi. Hi, uh, guys. Again, sorry about the delay and technical difficulties. But yeah, no, the, the concept of prevention of fibroid is really relatively a new concept, or, or I would say more recent concept. Um, but it just makes sense for such a very, very common disease. And of course, very debilitating to uh, our patient, our patient on the, on the call. Uh, I'm sure they, they relate to that and they understand that. Uh, prevention is the way. Whenever a disease is so common, prevention is really the way to go. We cannot just keep chasing the disease by treatment or tertiary prevention, as you heard. Uh, first, uh, there's a lot of suffering until the treatment start and the treatment take place. Also, treatment usually is much more difficult than prevention. Treatment, for example, of fibroid usually include surgery, invasive procedure, expensive hormonal treatment, and so on. Much more costly, much more invasive than prevention. If you think, for example, about the COVID, uh, we have all seen COVID cases in ICUs and using very expensive treatment, but the prevention with the vaccine was much easier, much simpler, and I would say uh, much more cost effective. So we're very excited in our team. Uh, I would say we're leading uh, the field in the concept of prevention of fibroid. 
So primary prevention, as you heard from uh, just now, is preventing the disease before it even starts. So, so this is, I would, I have to say, this is not available right now. This is a research concept. This is something we're developing in our lab and, and we're developing the tools to, to help us with that. So if you click the next figure, please. So, so this concept we have been working on in our lab, if you can see the dates here, I know it's very small font, but we developed this project in 2012. So almost 11 years ago, when I was at Meharry Medical College in Nashville. Um, and as you know, Meharry Medical College is a historically black research institution and medical school. And uh, I have seen a lot of patients with fibroid there. And that's really where the concept of fibroid uh, prevention became a reality because it's just so common. It's just a common disease. As we all know, uh, at any moment in the US alone, there's around 30 to 35 million women with fibroid. And many epidemiologists think there are more undiagnosed. They have heavy bleeding, they have symptoms, but they haven't uh, actually gone to see a doctor yet to actually get the diagnosis. So it's probably more than 35 million. And of course, around the world, the number goes probably in the billions. So, so the concept of prevention is really a must. So next slide, please. Uh, so, so that's really, uh, again, I want to stress that concept of primary prevention is not available yet as a clinical reality. It's a, it's a research concept. It's something we're developing the lab and we hope to be able to uh, implement, I'm hoping in the near future. But uh, if you look on the right side of the screen, uh, this is not nothing new. Uh, all women know and do pap smear, right? We do pap smear. So pap smear is actually a, a a version or, or an example of primary prevention. Uh, the picture there, that uh, gentleman there is Dr. George Babanikol. He is a Greek American. He is the one who actually developed the pap smear. That's why it's called pap smear from his last name, Babanikol. And uh, uh, why did we, why do we do it? And why did he develop it? Because cervical cancer, cancer of the cervix was uh, really almost an epidemic level a hundred years ago. Uh, it was the most common gynecologic cancer, and, and many women, unfortunately, died because of cervical cancer. Now, uh, we do pap smear on every uh, woman, uh, starting from the age of 21, right? And we do it every three years, etc. So this is a form of primary prevention. We do it in healthy women, women who have absolutely no symptoms. So that's why it's called a screening test or a prevention test. Most of women, pap smear come back normal, then everybody's happy. If it comes back abnormal, suggesting that this person will likely develop cervical cancer in the future, of course, then we intervene to prevent the, develop, the future development of cervical cancer. And we intervene, as you can see on the left side, by things like laser ablation of the cervix, uh, a procedure called LEAP. We do basically some kind of intervention on the cervix to destroy these abnormal cells so that the cervical cancer doesn't develop. And because of the success of this uh, process, and because uh, many women comply with this program and they go to their doctor and have a pap smear uh, every three years and so on, cervical cancer became a rare thing in all the countries that uh, have a pap smear program. In the US, for example, cervical cancer now is the lowest or the least common uh, cancer uh, of women uh, while I said 100 years ago, it was the most common. So there was a reduction of about 90% in the prevalence of cervical cancer. And even those 10% uh, or so, unfortunately, who still have cervical cancer, it's actually because when we take their history, because they have not done the pap smear regularly and so on. So if we go to the right side, so that's the reality on the left side. The right side is the research concept that we are developing for fibroids. So we, we want to develop a test. And in our lab, we are, I would say we are closer to a urine test, a test we can do on, simply on a urine sample uh, of women, uh, young women in late teens or early 20s uh, before they develop fibroid. And these women are healthy, the same concept like a pap smear. So every woman in late teens or early 20s 
uh, will have to do research and see what's the appropriate age to start. But I would say probably 18 or so, because uh, fibroid, unfortunately, happens so early, especially in women of color. I have seen patients as young as 19 and 20 uh, African-American with fibroid already. So if we want to prevent a disease, we need to go ahead before the disease develops. So let's say late teens, every uh, 18 years old or so, can have that urine test. And that test will tell us if this individual on her way to develop fibroid, she has high risk of future development of fibroid or not. If not, of course, everybody's happy. Uh, but if she is at higher risk of developing fibroid, then we can intervene with simple things, which we're going to talk about in a second, uh, as vitamin D supplement and green tea uh, supplement. And we can actually prevent the de development of fibroid. So that's the concept of primary prevention of fibroid. Uh, again, I want to emphasize we're not there yet, but it's something we're working on on the research level. Can I have next slide, please? But then secondary prevention is something we have. And, and I have been practicing this with my patient and many of my fellows and uh, colleagues and people that I have interacted with and uh, listened to me are, are practicing this. This is something we can do now. So secondary prevention, as you heard a couple of minutes ago, in somebody who have the disease already, but the disease is early. For example, uh, many times I've seen patient with fibroid, but they have just a couple of small fibroid. Maybe their period just started to be slightly longer, slightly heavier, but the disease is not severe yet. Or they had severe disease and they had myomectomy, as we all know, myomectomy is the surgical removal of the fibroid. But we know that fibroid, unfortunately, comes back uh, very frequently after myomectomy. So they had the myomectomy. So now they have either no fibroid at all or, or uh, maybe very small fibroid. But we know with time, the recurrence rate of fibroid within three years is about, uh, in some studies, up to 70%. So we know it's just a matter of time. They will have fibroid again then we can use these, this, these steps to prevent the recurrence of fibroids. So what are these steps? We, uh, as you see on the screen, we published that vitamin D can kill fibroid cells. We published that in 2011. And since then, 114 articles uh, from other groups confirmed our work. And we also published that specific extract of green tea, it's called EGCG, also can kill fibroid cells. And uh, uh, at least 24 articles also confirmed our work. So next slide, please. So yeah, so on the right side is what's happening now. Uh, you can see this uh, young lady. And uh, if you look at the fibroid, she only have small fibroid, either because it's early disease, the disease is diagnosed early, or maybe she just had a myomectomy and only two small or three small fibroids are there. What we do now is what's on the right side of the screen. We just wait. Uh, when most of doctors see a patient with a mild fibroid situation, they tell them, let's just follow it. Let's just do ultrasound every year and see and see what happens and come back when your symptoms are worse. Uh, or after myomectomy, we just wait and see. What uh, I'm suggesting for secondary prevention is not to do that, is to actually prevent the progression of the disease or the recurrence of the disease using vitamin D and green tea extract, which is on the left side of the screen. So can you click the next slide or next uh, animation? Yeah, so what I'm advocating is not to just wait and see or watchful observation, etc., is to actually actively prevent the progression of the disease. And what we have found through a lot of research is uh, using 500 international unit of vitamin D every day, which is uh, over the counter. You don't need a prescription for that. And, and not or, and uh, the EGCG, it's a specific extract of green tea. Uh, uh, the active ingredient in green tea is called EGCG. It's a very long chemical name, Ibigal Catching Galate. You don't need to remember that. Using 800 milligram of that per day together, uh, uh, can and are able to prevent the progression of the disease or recurrence of fibroid after myomectomy. 
And and I have few remarks about how to use this, the best way to use it, but we can talk about this uh, a bit later. And Dr. Hundi, I think you were, so you said 500, but I think it's because the slide says 5,000. Oh, 5,000, sorry. Yeah, it's 5,000. <laughs> okay. Correct. Thank you. So with that, given this prescription, we wanted to, at this point, have um, some comments from Lillian Prince. And we're getting some questions in, and we'll definitely get to those in a moment. Um, but Lillian, if you wanted to share your story and kind of your experience, and especially how you encountered Dr. Alhindi, which I think is a fabulous story. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. And thanks to Dr. Alhindi and the, and the Alhindi team. And also a shout out to um, our African collaborators, especially Mama Liz joining us from Fiber Foundation Africa in Ghana. <laughs> and I also saw Dr. Prosper Igboeli, uh, one of our Nigerian collaborators based there in Georgia. So thanks so much. Tried to spread the word. <laughs> so my story actually begins in, I was in my late thirties and I had no symptoms other than my clothes just weren't fitting anymore. I just had that waistline and everything else was small, but for some reason, my clothes just weren't fitting. I didn't have heavy menstrual bleeding that I found out it's later a common symptom that many women that I um, encountered had. So, but I remember that my mother had had uh, fibroids. And so when I went to the doctor, she said, well, your uterus is quite large, your feet are swollen, and I think you might just have this big fibroid there. So they sent me to an oncologist. I had the scans, had to uh, do, I think, an MRI. So I drank the gadolinium because they were quite uh, unclear as to what they were seeing. So then I went to the gynecological oncologist and they, you know, he was kind of, uh, well, we won't know until we actually cut you open, but we were, uh, my, my partner and I, we were quite adamant about not wanting a hysterectomy. So as I was going through these follow-up appointments and surgical prep, everyone kept saying, oh, you're here to have a hysterectomy. I said, no, I'm not here to have a hysterectomy. I'm here to have my omectomy. So the day of the surgery, I was actually, I'll, I'll back up a moment. So at that time, I'm really, really grateful. At that time, we had a uh, resident from Chicago, OBGYN resident from Chicago. So I was in, um, in Ohio and she was coming to my church. And so I took her the papers that they gave me from the doctor's office and I asked her, you know, what does this mean? And so she explained and she says, well, this means when you're on the surgical table, if they feel, the doctors feel that they need to do a hysterectomy, they will do a hysterectomy. I said, we clearly said we did not want a hysterectomy. So the day of the surgery, I was probably not the ideal patient that Dr. Alhandi wanted to have. I was uh, 6 a.m. in the morning going rounds with the surgeon and the surgical team before I would go into the surgery. And so they had to take the paperwork back, switch the paperwork to reflect my wishes because they, you know, say, well, if you have cancer, you know, what are we going to do? And I said, well, you know, I don't believe I have cancer. And so they did the surgery. Many, many hours later, a lot of blood loss later, they told me, okay, it looked really awful. Everything was really, looked really bad when they first, when they cut me open. So um, they ended up doing a lot of, you know, cutting, a lot of repairing, and they ended up actually leaving a couple in because he didn't want to cut so far into the lining of, of the uterus. And so um, they took out a lot of small ones, huge, large basketball size um, fibroid. And then, you know, I recovered. He said, OK, you know, go, go your way. You know, you might need some help getting pregnant later, but, you know, you, you, you recovered. You came through that. So in that interim time of recovery, I just did a lot of research, you know, a lot of reading, you know, just trying to find out as much as I could, you know, about fibroids. Like why do many Black, why is it so common, you know, among African-American women? And, you know, most of the surgeons that I was meeting, they were just saying, well, we're not really concerned about the basic science. We're concerned mostly about preserving the uterus, you know, the needs of the woman, you know, what what is the 
the patient need and doing the best, you know, that we can do in that vein. So I entered graduate school because I wanted to, you know, be able to contribute to the field of science. Because at that time, I was a statistician, was ready to go out into the world and get a job and ended up getting a hospital room instead. <laughs> so uh, I was at a conference and a young lady there at a stats conference named Erica Baxter. She told me, she said, you know what? You should go to PubMed and just look and see who's doing research on uterine fibroids because I was having no luck finding an advisor. No one was studying uterine fibroids. I had even a doctor whose daughter is a gynecologist say, why do you want to study that? You should just, just study what someone else is doing. There's no money in uterine fibroids. <laughs> so I ended up doing exactly what Erica told me and I found Dr. O'Handy and I called him, just like I called the other doctors. He was so receptive. He was like, yes, you know, you have a, uh, you know, we have a lab here in Georgia. You know, you're welcome to come. You know, what do you want to do? What are you studying? Just quite receptive. And long story short, in 2019, I came to Chicago and joined the O'Handy team as a graduate student. And my research focuses on uh, uterine fibroids in women of African descent because as uh, Mama Liz from uh, Fibroid Foundation Africa who's on, she will tell you, and I know Dr. Igboeli will tell you, it's so, so common there as well. So, you know, I just felt we can't leave our sisters there behind because they, you know, we're suffering here in the United States and, you know, they're having many more uh, challenges than, than we are here. So I learned about EGCG. I learned about vitamin D3 from Dr. O'Handy. I passed out the articles, those literatures, forwarded them to as many people, many women I was meeting, always meeting a woman at, even at the dentist's office, at the library, in the store, on my job. Just so many women who were who had uterine fibroids and, you know, were, were like me, you know, just wondering, well, do we just have to get a hysterectomy? And I was like, no, you know, we have this, this wonderful team that's doing doing this awesome research about uh, ways to uh, preserve your fertility. So if I would have known back then, you know, maybe I would not have gone through and had the, the first surgery because as Dr. O'Hanney said, you know, they have a high recurrence rate. So in 2016, before I met Dr. O'Hanney, that's when I, I started feeling that why are my clothes not fitting again, <laughs> fitting again, and they're back again. So on the sonographer, she said, you know, you you can, you're there as a patient and you just see gray, you know, on the screen. But then you look at the sonographer's face and she was, you know, just really honest when I asked her, you know, what do you see? And she just said, I just see five birds all over. So, you know, you get that disheartening feeling in the title of, of our, uh, what the what the F today. So, you know, it's it's a it's quite traumatic. It's a, a very traumatic experience. It's a heartbreaking experience. And you know, it, you you go through a lot as a uterine fibroid uh, patient, but also, you know, just husbands go through a lot, not just a woman, but family members go through this experience with you as well, community members as well. So uh, I saw one of the young ladies posted something in the in the chat. And I find it quite interesting, though, that I was meeting clinicians that didn't know anything about this research. But, you know, me as a as a patient, I would sit and just read the Green Journal, you know, before I even met Dr. O'Handy and know, knew about these uh, different remedies, you know, different alternatives to hysterectomy, because that definitely should not be the first uh, the first choice, you know, that you give to a woman especially, you know, those young ladies in, in their 20s, you know, just getting married and wanting to start families. So I really believe that we should uh, develop some type of toolkit or some type of program, even for our clinicians to know what's out there other than um, surgery. So with that, I thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Lillian. That was, I, I see a lot of people in the chat definitely were struck by your story and I'm sure they, they're feeling some deja vu, <laughs> um, which is, is difficult because a lot of folks are talking to their doctors. I do wanna, before we go into primary prevention, because as Dr. Alhendi said, that's kind of the vision 
that's like the concept car um, in the room right now um, that that he's really working hard at and we hope we, we support him and 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 I think the question did come up about why don't more doctors talk about this kind of prevention and our hope certainly with the research committee is that we're getting this out. We do invite doctors to these forums. And so we're hoping that the researchers that present in these forums um, can reach some of those doctors as well as patients so that on both sides of the, the, the visit of a health with a healthcare provider, you have some information. Um, so, so why don't more doctors talk about it? That's probably a much longer conversation, um, but we hope that we can play a role in, in getting um, physicians more educated. Um, there were a couple of questions on EGCG and some questions on some other methods, which we're gonna kind of pin those um, just um, probably until after we finish, because I know we got started a little late. Does the EGCG have caffeine? And then there was another question, Dr. Alhendi, about can you substitute it with one or two cups of decaf green tea? Yeah, I, I saw some of these uh, questions in the chat that they are all uh, really right on the point and so on. So I'm, I'm glad you're going to bring some of those up. But but before I answer that, uh, speaking of doctors, I, I saw actually a couple of doctors already on the call. Dr. Winston Thompson, uh, he's the head of uh, physiology at Morehouse School of Medicine. So your neighbor there in Atlanta, uh, as most of you know, Morehouse is, uh, is the largest uh, historically black medical uh, school in the country, and Dr. Thompson is doing really pioneering work also on fibroid and endometriosis and so on. And of course, I saw my my dear friend, Dr. Igboli, that uh, Lillian mentioned. Uh, we worked together also in Georgia for many years. So, but yeah, about the EGCG, uh, that that's a very good point. So one, uh, yes, I would recommend, and that's what we used in the study, and that's what I recommend to my patient is to use the decaffeinated. Yes, absolutely. There is a decaffeinated version there. A couple of points on the EGCG. Uh, as I showed on the slide, uh, the, our studies suggest that you really get the best uh, result when you use 800 milligram of EGCG, not the total green tea extract. Uh, so I'll, I'm gonna explain that. So when uh, this, again, all of this is over the counter, uh, and that's really one of the nice thing I like about it. You don't need a prescription. You don't need to see a doctor, all of that. Uh, of course, I will always encourage you, and I saw in some of the slides, you should always coordinate with your uh, healthcare provider, etc. But uh, you don't need a prescription for that for those two particular supplements. So the green tea extract that you find in the store, and many of my patients take pictures and send me in my charts and things like that, uh, you need to read the fine print and see how much EGCG in there. So let's say um, your green tea extract, say it's uh, 1600 milligram per tablet, for example. And then the fine print say it's 50% EGCG. So that's perfect. So 50%, half of 1600, that's 800 milligram. That's perfect. Then you are putting in your body 800 milligram of EGCG every day. Uh, but if not, then you need to do the math and see how much of the total green tea extract you need to take to put in your body 800 milligram of EGCG every day. That's one thing. The decaf is much better. Uh, that's what I recommend. That's what we do in our use in our clinical studies and so on. The last thing I want to say on EGCG, it's a very strong medicine. So you need to use it on full stomach. Uh, if you don't, if you use an empty stomach, it's going to cause nausea and you might even vomit. And I can tell you that from experience. So, <laughs> so it's very potent. So please use it after the main meal of the day, uh, whether it's lunch, dinner, um, and make sure you use it in full stomach. And that's it. Uh, the vitamin D, I saw a couple of comments on vitamin D, which vitamin D, any form of vitamin D, D3, D2, because they actually convert in the body to each other. So uh, 5,000 international unit of vitamin D, uh, any form of vitamin D. Again, that's over the counter. Um, the serum level, so because the absorption of vitamin D, there is some variability between people. So the target is to keep your uh, vitamin D serum level between 30 and 80 nanogram per mil, that number that you see on the screen here. So 5,000 is what we found usually get you there, but I would still encourage you to work with the provider or your nurse practitioner or uh, physician assistant, etc., um, to measure your vitamin D level. 
uh, you might have to adjust the dose uh, a little bit to get to that range. 5,000 for some people might not be enough. So the target is to get your level between 30 and 80, and the closer to 80, the better, the more effect, the good effect you'll have on the fibroid and so on. Thank you so much. Um, I do wanna add, um, Jocelyn Dubin is a dietitian and um, does um, knows about the health benefits of EGCG and asked um, if it only works for women um, post myomectomy or for those who have fibroids and are choosing not to have a myomectomy. When when is it good? Um, this is to who? You, Dr. Alhendi. Ah, okay. Yeah, and uh, we did actually both. In the study we did when I was at Meharry, and this is uh, actually was NIH funded study um, in 2013, and that's published already. We, that was women with fibroids, just with symptoms related to fibroid, the heavy bleeding, the pelvic pain, discomfort, all of that. And we had 80 patients, uh, 40 randomized to placebo, the sugar pill, 40 to EGCG, 800 milligram. And we followed them for six months. And those on the EGCG had very good results, about 33% shrinkage in their fibroid, improvement in uh, decrease in the bleeding, improvement in their hemoglobin level, basically a reversal of their anemia, et cetera. Uh, while the placebo, unfortunately, the fibroid grow actually about 20% more. So, uh, so it can work, uh, definitely work on those with mild to moderate uh, fibroid disease. Uh, then since then, I have been using it in my patient and many of my colleagues uh, that I work with do that after myomectomy. So after the myomectomy, you can use it to prevent the recurrence, either prevent it totally or at least delay it as much as possible. Thank you. And and I guess there's another question um, for you, Dr. Alhendi, or I'm going to direct it to you um, in terms of taking these supplements in addition to hormone treatments or medical management, my fembri, et cetera. Um, so, so if you can answer that, and then also if there are, is there anything that, that would be contraindicated for um, taking these? And of course we, as you mentioned earlier, we recommend that before you take any supplementation, you work with your healthcare provider just in case it um, conflicts with anything, but yes. Is there any yes, I, I emphasize that. Uh, always coordinate with your uh, healthcare provider. Uh, and again, as Lillian said, it's actually kind of a win-win because he or she then would, if they didn't know about this, they will get to know about it. There's a lot of literature that hopefully they will be interested to read about it and so on. But I, I love the question about the hormones and, and these uh, natural compounds. Of course, uh, EGCG and vitamin D, these, these are natural compounds. These are not hormones. However, like I said a couple of times, uh, they are because they are natural compound, they're really very inexpensive and very well tolerated. I would say virtually no side effects. The EGCG, again, if you take it on full stomach, then there's no side effects. Um, but they are not as potent as the hormones. So they are really very suited for the prevention, either mild disease early let's say mild to moderate fibroid or the to prevent the recurrence of uh, fibroid after myomectomy. However, I have seen a lot of patients uh, who say, okay, well, but I don't want to, I mean, I want to use natural products. I don't want surgery. I don't want hormones. However, the disease is so, has gone so far, became really severe. They have fibroid, you know, I'm sure you have heard about these, uh, so, kind of what Lillian said, large size fibroid all the way to the diaphragm or like huge fibroid, severe symptoms and so on. It, it's unlikely that these natural products will help in such severe disease. So what I have been doing now, and I'm a big fan of making surgery as the last resort, I have been using hormones, things like my fembri, like Orion, some of these new FDA approved products, uh, with these uh, natural products, start together right away from the beginning. So my patient leave with a prescription and then information about this vitamin D and EGCG, because again, you don't need a prescription for that. And then we do this for a certain amount of time, six months, sometime a year, uh, and we follow with ultrasound. Then when we see good uh, progress, the bleeding is much better, there's a good shrinkage and so on. So now we have pushed the disease from severe to maybe mild to moderate, 
then then we stop the hormones and then carry on with the vitamin D and the EGCG. So then the disease doesn't progress again or doesn't uh, grow back again. So Dr. Alhendi, um, I'm an interventional radiologist. So here's my interesting question since I have you um, here. You know, I think you're going to talk a little bit more about the mechanism of action a little bit. I don't know in the side of like, again, how ECGC kind of works, you know, you know, as an interventionalist, we do uterine fibroid embolization a lot. Yes. Do you think same thing? Is there any benefit to potentially recommending, you know, again, at the time of UFI, either before or immediately after, same thing, trying to do a combination to see if we can get the average amount of the, you know, fibroids to shrink more than they already are. I know how we kill the fibroids is a different mechanism. I'm, since I have you, I'm just kind of thinking out loud and wondering right. your thoughts on that. I think that's a really good point. Uh, I'm afraid there's no studies on that specific situation. Uh, in terms of mechanism of action, uh, these uh, hundreds of paper I refer to, you, and again, they are not all from our team, obviously, uh, talk about the mechanism of action. But in summary, uh, it's really, there's a lot of inflammation in fibroid. So I would say the main uh, pathway or the principal pathway, these uh, both vitamin D and EGCG work by decreasing the inflammation in the fibroid and in the uterus overall, in the myometrium as well. And that's how they achieve shrinkage and so on. But speaking of blood flow and blood supply, uh, also they actually decrease angiogenesis. They decrease the uh, blood, uh, like new blood vessel formation inside the fibroid and angiogenesis and so on. Um, now, can they help after the embolization? You know, I guess uh, we're going to have to do the study uh, because my understanding, uh, and I've seen a lot of patients, uh, like, you know, months, a uh, few months after embolization for different reason. And when you do MRI, of course, like you see, it's almost like a ghost of a fibroid. It's like just like a shadow. I'm not sure how uh, active it is or how alive these fibroid cells are. So if, if it's not alive, then it's hard to imagine how these compounds would help. But I, I guess the, the short answer is really, uh, we're going to have to study this and see, see if, if it helps or not. Yeah, it may be interesting to see like, you know, preemptively, if you start them on, let's say a course of like three to six months before to see how much shrinkage, so you get some, they're still right. symptomatic and then do the UP and see if we get a much better volume yes. reduction with, with that type of approach. Yes, before, before the embolization makes sense. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, this has been a great discussion and I, we're going to get to some of the, because I think people are asking about other natural because everyone is interested in sort of um, some of the things that are out there. Um, so I, I do want to focus on because a lot of this is based on Dr. Alhindi's research. So there's a lot of stuff that is kind of out there in the sphere. I've seen castor oil and and various things. So so that actually I'm going to segue with primary prevention to the risk factor approach, right, which is um, you, you know, we mentioned it earlier under the definition of um, primary prevention is, you know, look at the risk factors and really be aware of them so that as you're going through your day to day life, you try to minimize them it's likely unavoidable entirely, but unless you live in a bubble, um, but there are non preventable ones which Dr. Alhendi spoke about. Um, so African American women are more likely. Um, it'll be interesting. I don't know if um, Lillian, if you have the information. I know um, Dr. Elizabeth is here. If there is some information about African actually, and, and I know there's been some some recent research um, on the continent. Um, but you know, uh, age is over 35 tends to be you know the increase in frequency according to again the research, um, depending upon how old you were when you actually had your first period, which is the Menarche age. Um, and then family history, Lillian talked about her mother had, so a lot of um, uh, white dress and I see the founder, uh, Tanika uh, Gray is also here and she has also family history. Um, but let's talk about the preventable, right? Um, so anything that you can do to prevent hypertension is good for you generally. <laughs> and there has been some connection made between hypertension. It's not clear whether or not which which comes first, right? There's a linkage, but we're it's not a causal linkage right now. Um, parity, which is talking about whether or not you actually have um, had children been pregnant. 
Um, BMI, so we do see as BMI goes up that there, um, there tends to be, again, a, a sort of increase in the, the prevalence um, at higher BMIs. Um, uh, physical activity, there's also been a linkage between how physically active you are. Um, diet, and diet is a very broad, as we know, um, kind of category. Um, and I know some people mentioned some things, they talked about teas and different things. Um, so again, you wanna focus on a healthy diet. I, as a health coach, try not to get too complicated with it. You know what's not healthy, let's be honest. <laughs> and then um, environment and EDC, which are probably in sort of the same, um, uh, or the, in, under an umbrella of the same. And EDC, for those who don't know, uh, are endocrine disrupting chemicals. And because this is considered a sort of hormonally driven condition, um, when you talk about, um, you know, disrupting your hormonal system with these various chemicals that are out in the environment, um, that can have an effect um, on um, your, your likelihood of developing fibroids. And then I, last but not least, because I think Dr. Alhundi is going to talk about this on his next slide, is stress and trauma. Um, which is where we start to see some of the non-preventable and the preventable kind of start to overlap because what we see in, you know, certain um, families and race and ethnicity and uh, you start to see where there may be more stress or more trauma experienced. Uh, so with that, um, we are we are looking at um, more research um, in terms of the White Dress Project and the research committee and really having another segment on lifestyle. So hopefully we can explore those further. But just to make sure everyone is aware of those, because that's the first step. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Alhindi. Right. So, I mean, really, uh, you covered it very well. I mean, the, there's some uh, kind of uh, redundancy here because exactly I'm going to repeat some of what uh, the good information you just mentioned. So this is uh, a slide from uh, a review article we published last year, uh, Dr. Bariani and our team and, and others, really summarizing uh, the state of the art out there from the literature some of our work, but of course, uh, a lot from other people work about the risk factors for fibroid uh, and why actually fiber is more common in uh, African American in the US or uh, women with African uh, um, uh, diaspora in general uh, worldwide. And, and this is really the state of the art uh, uh, of last year, and I think it's still quite valid uh, up to now. Uh, so things like the EDC that you just heard about, endocrine disrupting chemicals, exposure to that, especially early in life, when the uterus or even in utero, when the when the individual is still just a fetus, the mother, the pregnant mother getting exposed to EDC, uh, that's really detrimental uh, uh, when the uterus is still just being developed and the sensitive, every organ have the sensitive period of development and the uterus sensitive period is during inside the womb when the fetus, the female fetus in the uterus of her mom and also the first few years of life. Uh, so exposure to adverse environmental uh, pollution, EDC, things like phthalate, like uh, DES, etc. Uh, really uh, is a major risk factor. Obesity, as you just heard, uh, is a major risk factor. Um, altered the, the bacteria that's uh, in the gut, but also in the reproductive organs, in the uterus and the vagina. Uh, actually, it turned out that there's also bacteria, or at least pieces of bacteria in the uterus as well. So the altered microbiome, uh, is also a risk factor. Vitamin D deficiency, uh, we are actually the group that uh, discovered this uh, many years ago. And then since then, many other groups confirmed that, that vitamin D deficiency is an important risk factor for fiber. And then the issue of uh, stress, <coughs> sorry, racism, uh, uh, discrimination, all of that causing chronic stress. So all of these factors, and you really don't have to have all of them. Uh, but uh, and there's a lot of interrelation, uh, as I will comment in a second. Uh, all of this converge to cause a lot of inflammation in the wall of the uterus, in the myometrium. And then this chronic inflammation, I'm talking about uh, women in their teens, early 20s and so on, living with this inflamed uterus, inflamed wall of uterus. If that doesn't get better, if we, if we don't intervene with some of the things we talked about, vitamin D, EGCG, or if some of these factors are not reversed for, you know, somehow by uh, the things we heard about, uh, exercise, healthy lifestyle, etc., this chronic inflammation eventually lead to DNA damage. 
And once you have the DNA damage, a specific mutation that has been connected to fibroids called the MET12 mutation appear. And once you have the MET12 mutation, you de you're definitely going to have fibroid. So, so this is the kind of the most accepted theme or, or pathway uh, in the field right now that leads to fibroid. So after I start, we published that and I start to present this in conferences, many people came and say, well, racism and discrimination is really not, a, not, not one of the factors. It's really the underlying factor because uh, racism is the reason why certain community get more exposure to EDCs and live in poor neighborhoods is why there's uh, some communities that have less access to fresh uh, you know fruits and vegetables and and obesity and obesity actually cause vitamin D deficiency because vitamin D is a fat soluble uh, vitamin so so they really convinced me and we are going to publish a, a follow-up uh, letter to the editor in new england journal about that that actually racism is really the underlying factor to all of this so that's why i i, I start to call this uh, slide if you uh, click the next uh, button please i start to call it uh, injustice caused it but the good news is science some of the things we talked about today and some of the other uh, work from other labs hopefully can help to, to uh, decrease uh, the prevalence of this disease. And of course, the hope and the dream may be even eradicated at some point. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, I to add that there is a recent paper by Dr. Erica Marsh um, that was just released around this whole concept of discrimination and particularly race-based and how it is related to fibroid prevalence. So absolutely. Uh, we'll absolutely. include all these things in the notes in YouTube if you want to go back to them. Right. So this is this is uh, back to the concept of primary prevention. So so this myometrium, this wall of the uterus. Um, sorry, I cannot uh, use my pointer on my end. But if that wall of the uterus, uh, that's really where fibroid starts. Exactly. So so uh, our work and others like the the paper on the screen here is from uh, our neighbors in Michigan, Dr. Jose Texira. But there's other papers from Northwestern and, of course, from our group showing that uh, there is the myometrium or the wall of the uterus that will never develop fiber. That's myo N. And then there is the myometrium that has a lot of inflammation. And in its way, if we don't intervene and reverse that, eventually it's going to develop fiber. It's just going to start to show up in that myometrium. And we call this myo F. And again, back to the concept of primary prevention, we are uh, kind of uh, homing in a, a urine test that we can look for certain factors that can tell us if this individual who still doesn't have fibroid, we do ultrasound, the uterus looks fibroid free, there's nothing there, and she doesn't have symptoms yet, but uh, it can tell us if this person have myo F or myo N. And of course, if she has myo F, then that's when we can then intervene by EGCG and vitamin D as a primary prevention to hopefully uh, avoid the ever development of fibroid. So this is kind of coming back to the concept of primary prevention. Right, so, so yeah, so that's, that's the hope. Again, emphasize uh, that's not uh, current clinical practice, this is, hopefully in the foreseeable future. Uh, uh, this is, uh, if you look at that person up there in the upper part of the screen, she has no fibroid. You look at the uterus, doesn't have fibroid, but uh, she most likely have this myo, it has this uh, myometrium, it's inflamed. And, and if nothing is done, she's gonna develop fibroid. And that's what we do now. We, this individual actually don't seek help because they have no symptoms and there's no way to find them anyway. Even if they come to the doctor, we do ultrasound, we're not gonna see anything. So we wait until the fibroid appear. Then, then it become treatment or tertiary prevention. And we talked earlier that this is very costly. There's a lot of symptoms, a lot of misery, a lot of surgery, a lot of procedure and so on. Of course, that's what we do now and we need to do something now to help our patient but it's probably not the most cost-effective and the most uh, successful strategy. So our hope is what's on the left side, is that we develop that urine test. We develop this as a screening test for all women, sort of a pap smear for fibroid. And those who have positive tests, that means they have inflamed myometrium, and it's just a matter of time, they will develop fibroid. Then we can use 
actually the same strategy of the secondary prevention, the same dose of vitamin D 5,000 unit, uh, international unit per day, EGCG 800 milligram per day to actually prevent fibroids from even appearing in the first place. Yeah, so that's uh, basically emphasizing this uh, approach that uh, we have been uh, promoting and we have published a lot on and I've been using in my patients successfully and, and I hope uh, more and more patients will be interested uh, and talk to their provider about this. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Alhendi. We're gonna get to a couple more of the questions. I know we're a little bit over, but we did start a little bit later. Um, I encourage you to um, direct friends, um, your doctor to the video, which we will post within the next week um, so that they can get educated. And again, in the show notes, we'll have the research. If they wanna click on the research to get further educated, we'll make it easy. And that's our job. Um, our next best step, you got the prescription um, from Dr. Alhendi. Again, it is evidence-based. It has worked and been working. Um, we encourage you to be proactive. This is what prevention is all about, right? Being proactive. So get screened, know your numbers. Um, if you come to the empowerment experience in July, we hope that we're, we're, we're hoping Dr. Alhendi is gonna be there with us. And we're hoping we have some new announcements around this whole area. And we hope, we're also looking for some sponsors to make sure that um, whether you have insurance that covers it or not, that you can get vitamin D screening covered because that's one of the numbers you wanna know in order to, to understand you know, how important you know, really um, taking this prescription is. Remember, consider and review any supplementation that you decide to take with your healthcare provider. So you've got the prescription. Um, and of course, stay tuned with us, come to these monthly sessions, continue to educate yourself and others um, on not only these new, this new research, but the fibroid risk factors and develop your own prevention strategies. Um, so I always say each one teach one. Um, that was something I learned as a, as a, um, as a youth um, and it's tell a friend. Right, because this information, as we talked about, some doctors don't have it, some potential patients don't have it. So the more we spread the word, the better. And consider the lifestyle options. Um, and that includes stress management strategies and you know your consideration of your environment and environmental factors. Um, we, again, hope that we'll be able to do something and, and maybe we'll include some of that at the empowerment experience to talk about some of these other specific um, you know, potential EDCs in particular products. And you know we're talking about cosmetics and we're talking about um, cleaning products that you might be using, um, pesticides um, that you might be using on your lawn. So those are all different environmental things that we're exposed to constantly that you can try to minimize as much as possible. Um, with that, uh, go to the next slide. We have two things that I wanna, two more commercials that I have before we go to that. So we've been doing questions. You can participate in a study. Woo! So the first one we're gonna talk about, um, and we love that we're able to bring this to you so you know about it, because participation of women in these studies is the way in which we're going to get more of the answers that you're all looking for. So there's first, Dr. Alhendi's lab, in conjunction with a number of other study sites, is doing the FRIEND fibroid and infertility trial. So um, again, uh, we'll have this information in the uh, in the show notes in YouTube. But um, again, for more information, you can um, call or email Dr. Sablini, who is um, one of the lead contacts for it. And basically, they're using the green tea extract we just talked about, the EGCG, to investigate pregnancy success in addition to um, using intrauterine insemination in women with fibroids. So if you're interested in fertility and, you know, kind of experimenting with um, some some new methods, 75% um, um, will be in an arm that will actually get the green tea extract, but again, blind. Um, so, so that's one, um, which again, you can get more information. And I don't know if you want to put, um, Mikhail, the stuff in the, in, the, um, in the chat so that people have it. And then next, and there's multiple study sites, so you have access based on where you are. Um, so we don't have to do this. I'm sorry, I didn't take that out. And next slide. 
Is there no more? Oh, okay. So I put it in. Um, there is also in out of NYU, um, the fibroid center there, the Center for Fibroid Care. They have a currently a lifestyle intervention in fibroid elimination. And so they are doing a, a study and looking to enroll right now. You do have to be in New York for this, um, but you can reach out to them um, directly and, and say that you're interested. Um, you know, you have to, your insurance has to be compatible with NYU, but you don't have to be treated by an NYU doctor. And now you can go back um, one, um, if you can, Rochelle. Um, so this study actually does include vitamin D and EGCG among other evidence-based supplements. So there's a little bit of a supplement package. They're getting the exercise counseling. We talked about physical activity um, and we talked about diet, right? So there's gonna be um, nutritionist support, um, registered dietitian support focused on eating nutrient dense foods. Again, fruits and vegetables are some of the most nutrient dense, um, being consistent with the timing of your meals. Uh, I saw in the chat, Lillian was talking about processed food, added sugars, um, and being mindful when you eat, which is actually also a part of it because you actually have a nervous system as part of your digestive system, your enteric nervous system. And so if you're stressed and you're kind of thinking about all kinds of things, you're not actually allowing your digestive system to, um, to optimally uh, process your food um, so that you're getting all of the nutrients if you're eating nutrient dense foods. Um, and then drinking water. Uh, which allows all of these supplements to circulate in your body and get where they need to be. Uh, so given that, I think that's all we have. I know there were some other questions. Um, we want to hear from you. What else do you want to hear about? Um, there was a question about any particular brands of vitamin D or um, EGCG. I don't think, I think um, Lillian answered that there's no recommendation. It's just get it. Um, I think we want to make it simple. Uh, yeah. And then there were some questions about other things, Dr. Alhindi, and you can speak to whether or not there's research around it, but there was questions about dairy, castor oil packs, um, red raspberry tea, which always comes up when we talk about anything <laughs> with respect to women's reproductive system. So is there anything else that is, because again, remember, this is a research forum, so there's lots of um, sort of anecdotal evidence out there. But is there any research that you're aware of, if anything else, besides the vitamin D and EGCG? You're absolutely right about this anecdotal evidence. There are so many things. That if you just do a Google search on anything, you will probably find a connection to fibroid and so on. So what we are, uh, the things I presented today, it's all based on evidence. And I uh, mentioned the number of papers in the hundreds confirming these. Uh, that's why I want to stick to that. However, uh, I have a, a wonderful postdoc in the team, uh, Dr. Sumaya uh, Via. She's writing a review article. Uh, uh, she called it Escape, Evidence-Based uh, Approach to Secondary Prevention of Fibers. So she's really going through the literature, literally paper by paper, and, and she's going to develop a list of all the uh, supplement and natural compounds or or even avoiding certain environmental um, exposure, certain cosmetics, things like that, but all evidence-based and uh, hopefully we'll be able to publish that soon. Well, that is tremendously exciting. Uh, we get a lot of questions about that. And um, yeah, so we hope to invite um, that person. I don't remember, I, the name was hard to remember. Oh my, uh, she, yeah, she might yeah. be on the call. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we definitely would like to have a, a forum around that because that is a common, a common asked question. And we want to bring the latest and greatest, um, especially if it's a overall review of the literature um, to the, to this audience. Um, so, um, okay. So I, I got asked a couple of things about the contact email address for the NYU Langone study. Um, it is actually a phone number. You can just call the Center for Fibroid Care, um, 646-754-3106. Um, and they're enrolling. Um, remember, with Dr. Alhendi's lab and the fertility in fibroids, um, there is a number of sites, so you don't have to be in Chicago, um, even though it looks like it is lovely there right now, Dr. Alhendi. <laughs> it is, it is. But I, I can tell uh, the team about the site. So it's uh, at Yale. So that's New Haven. So really uh, New York and the vicinity and then uh, Hopkins or so Baltimore and then and then Chicago. Really, you have many options. We have three centers in Chicago, our center, University of Chicago, Northwestern University, and then University of Illinois, Chicago, another university in Chicago. 
So in, if in Chicago, you have lots of choices, but also uh, close to Baltimore, you have uh, Hopkins and close to um, uh, New Havens in Connecticut, uh, you have Yale as well. Thank you. All right, with that, we are going to close the call. We've gone over by 15 minutes, but we thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone's attendance. Um, and Dr. Ahendi, particularly to you for doing the work for this long. Um, and Lillian, thank you for sharing and, and kind of opening up your, your uh, sort of private <laughs> log uh, and, and sharing with us your story, because um, that's something that we want to do more of, but we also understand that some people are not comfortable with it and we hope to get more comfort around these topics. So remember, each one teach one, pass it on. We wish you well, snowflakes. <laughs> it might happen chicago you never know <laughs> i'm from minnesota originally so yes, you know, you know, you know, know. What, what she's talking about thank you so much thank you everyone thank you thanks for our african collaborators joining from ghana and elsewhere on the continent thank you so much i know it's late there uh, take care everyone bye-bye